Hello, and welcome to our final session of the Democracy Speaker Series. I am Teresa Lee, the Litigation Director of the Election Law Clinic here at the Law School. Along with the clinic, this series has been hosted by Professor Guy Uriel Charles, Professor Lawrence Lessig, and Professor Nick Stephanopoulos. And we all thank you for joining us over this past academic year. Today, we will be talking about gerrymandering. Leading us is Professor Nick Stephanopoulos, the Kirkland and Ellis Professor of Law here at Harvard Law School. Nick writes in many areas of the law of democracy, but in particular redistricting. He has written numerous articles in top law journals, as well as popular publications, but is also a litigator, having been architect behind two partisan gerrymandering cases that went to the Supreme Court over the past five years, in addition to cases within the election law clinic. Professor Stephanopoulos will moderate the discussion today and will be happy to take your questions. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom interface and we will do, do our best to get to them. Just a reminder that this is being recorded and will later be available on the HLS YouTube channel. Okay, Nick, over to you. Great, thank you, Teresa, uh, for that introduction. And many thanks also to our panelists and to the students uh, and alumni in attendance. Uh, as Teresa mentioned, this is the sixth and final session of Harvard Law School's Democracy Lecture Series. Uh, previous sessions have covered topics including threats to American democracy, the future of the Voting Rights Act, social media and democracy, ballot initiatives, and money in politics. Today's session will address redistricting, the decennial redrawing of district lines all across the country. Uh, as all observers of politics know, redistricting may sound like an obscure technical activity, but its effects on representation and policy are profound. And that's because how lines are drawn determines how votes are aggregated, and how votes are aggregated determines how competitive elections will be, whether political parties and minority groups will be fairly represented, and ultimately whether the work of the government will reflect the will of the people. Uh, these very high stakes are why the, the parties and other uh, actors pour tens of millions of dollars into redistricting. They're why there are hundreds of redistricting lawsuits every decade. And they're why reformers in this area are so fixated on changing the redistricting status quo. Um, let me also flag that we're gathered here at an especially interesting time uh, toward the end of the redistricting cycle for the coming decade. Uh, this is the first cycle since the Supreme Court nullified half of the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County v. Holder, and since the court eliminated the federal cause of action for partisan gerrymandering in Rousseau v. Common Cause. Uh, it's also a cycle that's notable for the increased use of redistricting commissions, uh, for the emergence of computer algorithms, that are capable of rapidly churning out uh, large numbers of district maps. Uh, for time crunches due to census delays, that's another feature of this cycle, uh, as have been proposals for sweeping federal statutory change. Um, and I'm sure that our panelists will comment on these and other developments. Uh, so speaking of our panelists, our first speaker will be Jason Torchinsky. Uh, Jason is a partner at Holtzman Vogel, specializing in campaign finance, election law, lobbying disclosure, and issue advocacy. Uh, Jason has been recognized by Chambers USA as one of the top government law attorneys in the country. He has also been honored by Politico as one of 50 Politicos to watch and by Campaigns and Elections Magazine as a rising star of politics. Uh, our next speaker will be Michael Lee, who serves as senior counsel for the Brennan Center's Democracy Program, where his work focuses on redistricting, voting rights, and elections. Prior to joining the Brennan Center, Michael practiced law at Baker Botts in Dallas for 10 years, 
He was also the author of a widely cited blog on redistricting and election law issues that the New York Times called indispensable. Uh, and he's a regular writer and commentator on election law issues. Uh, and our final speaker will be Duell Ross, who is a senior counsel and director of professional development at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Uh, in that role, he uses litigation and advocacy to ensure equal access to educational opportunities and the political process for people of color. Duell is also an adjunct professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School and the New York University School of Law. Uh, and with that, let me repeat what Teresa said, that audience members can ask questions using the Q&A feature on the screen. And let me turn the floor over to Jason for his opening remarks. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, Great. So let me get my screen share up. A little bit about partisan gerrymandering and the kind of state of, of the overall. Um, give you a sense of what's happened in terms of partisan control of redistricting over, say, the last 30 years. Uh, the map on the right here, uh, after the 1990 census, kind of where control was of congressional redistricting by state and in terms of by numbers. Um, Republicans in 1990 in the 1991 redistricting cycle controlled the, the held the pen for a total of five seats. Democrats controlled uh, the pen for a total of 172 seats. There were 240 seats that were subject to split control. There was um, there were 11 seats that were subject to commissions, and there were a handful of states. Uh, looks like five that were at large. Sorry, seven states that were at large, uh, meaning they didn't have enough population. Uh, contrast that to the 2020 cycle, you can see the red Republicans control, there are a lot more B. Um, the number of states that are blue, as you can see, are dramatically reduced, uh, and probably the most, the, the growth that we boast is in terms of the number of states that are controlled by commissions. Um, so that has made a significant difference in terms of how drawing has been done this cycle. To give you a status of redistricting, so far we are done, seven states are done with their initial drawing, composing about 397 members of the 435 member house that have completed drawing. So that's 94% of states that have finished their enactment or legislative process. 91% uh, of the districts for the 118th Congress are complete uh, through their initial enactment or legislative process, although we'll talk about litigation a lot. <laughs> Uh, during the course of this presentation. Uh, and you'll see lots of press stories about who's winning. Um, you know, those stories, in my view, are sort of, they're, they're processes. Um, you know, every looks at any particular map, um, you know, has a different view as to who is winning. Um, you know, let's just go back for a second. Nevada, for example, Democrats have drawn a map that they believe will elect four Democrats. Republicans have looked at the map that the Democrats have drawn in Nevada and said, you know what, you drew those maps so thin, frankly, that in a you know anticipated wave year like 2022, you can lose all four of those congressional seats to Republicans. So, you know, exactly who's winning or losing in Nevada kind of depends on whose analysis you listen to. Um, one of the most interesting sort of factors here is in the party controlled states, meaning the Republican states or the Democratic states, one party or another hold pen, you're seeing a reduction in what they would refer to as competitive seat. So in the 2020 Congress, 16 of the 19 Republican controlled states that have finished their mapping, there were about 79 Republicans, 24 Democrats, and 32 kind of competitive seats. Um, those seats elected you know, 124 Republicans uh, and 48 Democrats uh, in 2020. The projection is that those same elect 94 Republicans, five Democrats, and have 16 competitive seats for the 2022 elections. Uh, there are three more Republican controlled states that have not yet analyzed maps. Uh, New Hampshire, their legislature is actually in session um, through May. Uh, the same thing with Missouri and Florida actually is beginning a special session of their legislature today. Same reduction in competitive seats 
and states controlled by Democrats. Uh, a lot fewer seats at issue here, but you see, you know, the, the current eight states controlled by Democrats have 13 Republicans, 51 Democrats, and 12 competitive seats in Congress. And the predictions are that the next Congress will result in 56 Democratic seats, 10 Republican seats, and only nine competitive seats from those. In the 10 states that are drawn by commission, the number of competitive seats uh, appear to be very similar uh, and not a lot of change in projected sort of party representation from those states. Turning to litigation on partisan gerrymandering. Um, this is, uh, as Professor Stephanopoulos mentioned at the beginning, um, a long running battle. Um, obviously, the Supreme Court decided the Rucho case, which basically foreclosed gerrymandering causes of action uh, in federal court. So you're not seeing a lot of those. Um, the next big thing to watch in the federal courts, though, is the Berger case pending a certiorari out of North Carolina. Uh, basically, Rucho said federal, you know, federal courts, the U.S. Constitution doesn't prohibit partisan gerrymandering. So states, you go figure it out. The North Carolina Supreme Court um, issued a ruling earlier this year finding that the clause in the North Carolina Constitution that basically said elections shall be free and equal, <coughs> North Carolina prohibits partisan gerrymandering. Uh, the state legislature says not so fast. Um, you know, that language has been in our state constitution for something like 300 years and actually originated of human rights, which was written by some of the original gerrymanders, frankly, um, and basically have gone to the U.S. Supreme Court and said to the Supreme Court, you know, this is the state Supreme Court usurping power essentially assigned to the legislature by Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution with respect to congressional district court, you should overturn the North Carolina Supreme Court. Uh, on the stay petition, on a divided vote, the Supreme Court denied the stay, but the court pretty much indicated that there are at least four votes to grant a cert petition to visit this question. In North Carolina, uh, the North Carolina legislature promptly filed a cert petition um, a month ago, and I am anticipating that sometime in June, uh, before the end of this term, the Supreme Court will probably grant cert in that case uh, to be heard in the fall. So this really gets to the question of, you know, when, you know, to what extent does the U.S. Constitution essentially sort of cabin in state courts assertions of, of power? And there are a number of, of about the scope of, of, you know, this theory, broad does it go, does it cover more than just redistricting? Uh, what are, the, what are the boundaries here potentially for state Supreme Courts? I think there's going to be a lot of litigation over that in the course of this next decade. Uh, in state courts, we've seen probably seven lawsuits so far this year alleging partisan gerrymandering uh, in the state courts. Uh, those cases have taken place now in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Maryland, New York, Kansas, Oregon, and Ohio. Uh, four of them have been brought with Democrats as plaintiffs. Three of them have been brought with plaintiffs. So you can see it's relatively evenly divided in terms of which parties are bringing these cases. Um, and you know this sort of demonstrates kind of the reality of, of redistricting litigation, which is whichever side feels like they're losing seems to have every incentive to go ahead and file a lawsuit. So Republicans felt like they were on the short end of the stick in Oregon, New York, and Maryland. So they filed kind of felt they were on the short end of the stick in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Kansas, and Ohio, the lawsuit. Uh, North Carolina, as we mentioned, uh, that case is now pending certiorari at the U.S. Supreme Court. Pennsylvania was actually a deadlock case, but there was a partisan gerrymandering case uh, brought in 2017 that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court resolved, and that played a big role in which maps the Pennsylvania Supreme Court chose as a result of the deadlock. Uh, Maryland, the trial court found a partisan gerrymandering violation, uh, and then the governor and the legislature kind of worked out a solution that the governor was willing to sign, and the litigants basically didn't pursue the appeal through the system. Uh, in New York, the trial judge found that the map drawn by the Democrats in Albany was in fact a partisan um, and struck down not only the congressional district, but also their state house and state senate districts. 
the New York Court of Appeal or the Intermediate or the Appellate Division in New York allowed the this uh, allowed a stay to remain in place, and the New York Court of Appeals has indicated they will wholly resolve this litigation by the end of April. Uh, Kansas, uh, there was a trial that ended days ago, uh, and we're waiting on a ruling from the county. Uh, that case is expected to be appealed almost immediately to the Kansas Supreme Court. Uh, the Kansas case and the North Carolina case are very similar. The language in the Kansas Constitution that the plaintiffs are using to base their uh, partisan gerrymandering claims are nearly identical to the North Carolina language. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see if the Kansas Supreme Court using the exact same language as North Carolina comes to a different conclusion or comes to the same conclusion. Uh, if Kansas comes to the same conclusion as North Carolina, there is basically every expectation that Kansas will file for a stay and or cert petition with the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, in Oregon, uh, despite the fact that after a bipartisan agreement to share power in terms of districts, uh, when the Democrats that control the legislature changed their mind, uh, committee and chose the democratically the Democratic Party's preferred maps, the Oregon Supreme Court concluded that that was not in fact partisan gerrymandering um, and upheld the maps. And in Ohio, um, we still have back and forth in the state and federal courts about what exactly these maps are going to look like. They still have not settled on their state legislative maps. And last week, the um, Ohio Supreme Court struck down a fourth set of maps uh, for their state legislature. The Congress, they're on, I think, their second iteration, uh, still being challenged by the state court or in state court. But the Ohio Supreme Court set a briefing schedule that pretty much indicates that the maps will be in place at least for 2024. Um, where are we going with partisan gerrymandering battles? Um, one, I think we're gonna see some of these battles in the commissions. Uh, you know, What are their implementing statutes mean? Ones that prohibit considerations of, of partisan, uh, some that allow it, some that allow it in limited means, some that require competitiveness. Uh, I think we'll see lawsuits over some of those. Ballot measures are coming forward uh, more and more to either or create changes in state constitutions. Oklahoma, for example, there were two versions of a ballot measure over the last two years that were essentially battle. Um, unclear to me whether, you know, for example, another changes, another ballot change is coming in Oklahoma. Um, legislative changes are possible. Uh, there has been talk in Pennsylvania for a long time, for example, about whether there will be a state statute to create a commission to draw Pennsylvania's congressional districts in the future. Um, and I think we're going to see a, a larger and larger role for state courts going forward. As I mentioned, we already had partisan gerrymandering cases uh, in seven states so far this year, and I don't think those are done. Um, the other, just about districting litigation, um, we're basically seeing two rounds of this. Uh, because of the late release of the census data. Um, plaintiffs are seeking preliminary injunctions. The courts are granting or denying those. After the grant or denial of those, we'll have trials and, and three later this year and into next year about what these maps will look like for 2024. Um, I hope I kept to my, my five to seven minutes. Uh, quite close enough. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, let me turn the floor over to Michael. Let me unmute. I think I've managed to do that after two years of using Zoom. I, I uh, still sometimes struggle with that. But uh, thank you, uh, Nick, for having me and um, look forward to the good conversation today. I also do have a PowerPoint that I am going to share. So let me just do this. And I think, let me get rid of that. Second. Okay, that should is that playing? Not quite. Yeah, there we go. Um, so, um, I'm going to start with the the question that Jason asked about who is winning because that's like sometimes like what everybody wants to talk about. Like, you know, how did this cycle end up? And you know, I think in some ways the question is not the right one to ask because it's not clear. You know, the, the, the goal of, of when you try to gerrymander is that you try to like maximize your party's political power. But um, 
you know, like you obviously, if you've ever coached little league or, you know, any other kind of sport, you, you know, you know, that every cycle you play with, you know, you build your game plan around the team that you have. If Tom Brady is your quarterback, you're going to throw a lot, right. You know, if you have a so-so quarterback, you know, you're going to do different things. You might be more defensive, right. You know, and so like, it's not really clear to me that in this cycle, that the parties really sort of even are doing the same thing. And, and because they, they come from it from a very different landscape, you know, Democrats, the cycle only control at most 75 uh, congressional seats in terms of who draws the lines. De Republicans have 187. Um, and so like Democrats have to like, you know, uh, really sort of try to maximize what they can get out of the 75. And so they had a very different strategy going in there than Republicans did. Um, and let me just flip to the next slide. Um, here are some of the, the goals. Let me just try again. Um, let me just move this because it's in the way. You know, there are, there are different goals that you have in redistricting, and you know, you you some you know there there are oftentimes pressures that come in from different from incumbents. There are, um, you know, some one strategy is to maximize seats. That's that was certainly the strategy that happened after the twenty ten census when Republicans swept control of a lot of state legislatures in the midterms, and then you know redrew maps to sort of lock in power for the decade. Um, you know, uh, but they're, they're, hang on, I, this is really true. Anyway, um, but they're very different goals. Um, hang on, Nick, give me one second. I'm, this is just. We can all see your slide, Michael, if you want to just talk through it. Yeah, I'm, I'm just sorry, Nick. I mean, there's, no. there's, there's this like verbal, there's this thing that's popping up in the middle of my slides and I can't. So, um, yeah, so, 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 you know, and, and so take Texas, for example, um, you know, Republicans in Texas started out with a disproportionate share of seats about, roughly about two thirds of the seats in Texas. And, you know, the you know, but there was a lot of competition on the map and that's represented by the orange band there. You can see like in between the two red lines, there's, there are a lot of competitive seats. Texas was one of the most competitive states in the country over the last few cycles. What Republicans did in redistricting is that they chose safety over targeting any more democratic incumbents. They, a lot of people thought that they might go in and target people like Colin Allred or, Libby Fletcher in the Houston area and take them out. In other words, try to pick up Democratic seats. They didn't. Instead, what they did um, is that they made their seats a lot safer. Um, and you can see that by the blue band, right? You know, whereas there were a bunch of seats that were within Democrats' reach, you know, a little, some of them harder than others. Um, what happened in redistricting is that, as Jason mentioned, the competitive districts really disappear in this map and, and under this map, you know, Democrats could win almost 58% of the vote and still have the same number of seats they have when they win, you know, around 50% of the vote. So in other words, Texas could become a really blue state and Republicans would still have almost a two to one advantage for the congressional delegation. Um, and so this was sort of like the Republican strategy in this cycle. And you see that play out here. Um, and you really get a sense of what happened, right? You know, Republicans sort of made their districts like really Trump you know, before redistricting, there were 11 districts in Texas that Donald Trump won by 15 or more points. After redistricting, there are 21 such districts. So it almost doubles. There are only 24 districts in Texas that Republicans have altogether. So 88% of the seats that Republicans have in Texas are, are super Trump districts. Um, and, you know, that I think really tells you a, a lot sort of and, 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 and doing that like gives Republicans a lot of safety against both demographic change uh, which is very rapid in Texas, fastest growing state in the country, but also against political shifts, particularly in the suburbs that have sort of hurt Republicans in recent years. And so um, likewise, you know, they created a number of districts and they packed Democratic districts. You know, there are a lot more like super Biden districts, right? But what disappears are the districts sort of in the middle band that are, are competitive. Um, 
you can contrast that to like what Democrats did in New York. I mean, they you know they didn't actually increase the number of super Biden districts, and that I think is reflective of the fact that you know they were trying to take out Republican incumbents, so they wanted to spread Democratic voters out to try to knock out as many Republican incumbents as they could. The competition also disappears in the middle band. Uh, the Trump districts get a little bit. Um, you know, uh, Trump. The, some of the Trump districts get a little Trumpier, um, you know, because of the packing of Republican voters. But you know, really, what you know, you see a bunch of Democratic districts in that eight to fifteen range, and a lot of those are really closer to eight than fifteen for Biden. And you know, those are districts that you know, in a good Republican year, could easily be in play. So you know, overall, what you see here, and this is sort of the nation as of like the end of March. Um, you know, Democrats, Republicans reduced the number almost in half of competitive Trump districts. Democrats, um, you know, sort of have the same number of, of, you know, kind of Biden competitive, potentially competitive districts. Um, and, you know, in a wave year, or if the composition of the coalitions of the parties change, and there's, you know, that's something I think you have to factor in. Um, you know, there's a lot more vulnerability for, for Democrats, right? So on paper, like if the, if the election is a replay of 2020, you know, that's one thing, but, you know, like t past is not prologue. And as we saw from Virginia, like, you know, the, the compositions of party coalitions can change. And and so, um, you know, there's a lot more vulnerability on, on the Democratic side than I think on the Republican side. Um, and I think that really, you know, the choices parties made kind of told you both about what they're dealing with right now, but also, you know, sort of where their headspace is in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I think, you know, for all the bravado that Republicans had in places like Texas about we're going to win Latino voters, we're going to win back the suburbs, they didn't redistrict like that. And instead, um, you see things like this. This is like the 26th district is Collin County, north of Dallas, um, historically all in one congressional district. After redistricting, parts of Collin County, which you see on the sort of on the right, um, are drawn into the 13th congressional district, which stretches all the way to the Texas Panhandle, 500 miles away, um, because the suburbs are not very friendly territory to Republicans anymore. And so that tells you something about where Republican space is. You know, Democrats, on the other hand, in states like New York, seem to be betting that their coalition of recent years, young voters, women, um, suburban voters, um, will largely hang together. And so that's a very sort of different sort of headspace there. Um, and with that, I'll, I will stop and be glad to talk further. Great, thank you, Michael. And uh, last but not least, let me turn the floor over to Duell. And let me stop sharing, so. Hi, thank you for having me. So I'm going to, I mean, I think Michael had a really good point, which is, you know, who you view as the winners or losers really depends on how you view the game. And specifically from my perspective, the 2020 uh, redistricting cycle uh, has about, and about the uh, voters of color, right? And so from that perspective, really you're, you're thinking about something completely different than um, respectfully what Michael and Jason have been talking about, which is that have uh, black and Latino and other voters of color been adequately represented in the redistricting cycle? And the answer is pretty emphatically no. Um, we know from the beginning of the redistricting cycle that um, first of all, people of color were undercounted in the 2020 census. And so they started out with having, um, you know, having their numbers uh, lower than they really should have been if you had actually counted everyone who was available uh, in the redistricting cycle. And so with that, I'm going to talk just a little bit about kind of what the differences are between, um, you know, the different kinds of gerrymandering that we're talking about uh, and with the understanding that, you know, there's, there's sort of gerrymandering in the sense of violations of the Voting Rights Act, which from it means you've essentially drawn too few majority minority districts. And then there's another kind of gerrymandering, which is called you know, racial gerrymandering, which is essentially uh, you've drawn too many uh, majority minority districts. And then finally, there's what you know, we've largely been talking about today, which is partisan gerrymandering. You know, the, the in party drew too few of the out party districts. Republicans drew too many Republican districts for what is proportionate uh, to the Republican vote in the state versus Democrats, you know, doing the same to Republican voters. Um, and so with that, you know, I wanted to talk about kind of what the Voting Rights Act used to be and to talk about kind of what it does now. Um, the Voting Rights Act, as, as we'll talk more about, used to, uh, you know, cover a number of states that were subject to preclearance. Those were states, as you can see here, were mostly in the South. Um, they were states like Alabama, Texas, Arizona that were fully covered, states like California, New York, North Carolina, Florida that were partially covered. Those states that had a specific history 
of racial discrimination in voting. And each of those states uh, were obligated by the federal government to essentially, if they passed any new redistricting, they had to seek uh, what's called preclearance, basically permission either from a judge or from uh, the Department of Justice to, to enact any new districts, including you know, congressional districts, state legislative districts, moving a polling place, everything from top to bottom had to be pre-cleared by the federal government. And what that meant was that at least for minority voters in the in these states, uh, that there was some level of baseline of protection. Uh, those districts were, if you drew a majority black district, that district was protected uh, from what was called retrogression. So looking at a state like Mississippi that had one majority black district, you couldn't, uh, Mississippi couldn't go around and draw a second majority, or sorry, couldn't draw a, um, eliminate that existing majority minority district in a, uh, because that would be discriminatory against black voters. It also protected things like crossover districts, uh, which are essentially districts that, you know, allowed minority candidates to be elected, even though they maybe were less than a majority district. And so, you know, we, we began there uh, you know, going back to 1965, what would happen, as I think folks know, in 2013, is the Supreme Court essentially eliminated that uh, that coverage formula. And so, what you have in the 2020 uh, round of redistricting is that there's, this is the very first time since um, since the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965, in which there is no uh, sort of protection against backsliding, except for Section Two of the Voting Rights Act. And what Section Two does, as you sort of see there, is it, it essentially says that you can't uh, engage in what's called vote dilution, which is that you can't enact any kind of redistricting scheme intentionally or not, which gives people of color less opportunity as compared to others to elect their candidates of choice. And that's sort of a, um, you know, uh, a very brief summary of what the Voting Rights Act does, but what it essentially does is that in, in the example of Mississippi, they still could not eliminate the majority black district without facing a lawsuit, except that they're, now you would have to face a lawsuit, whereas in the past, under section five, Mississippi couldn't um, eliminate that district at all before the uh, federal court or the Department of Justice basically said, uh, had sort of a, a permanent injunction against any changes that were potentially discriminatory. Um, it's sort of the burden was on Mississippi to prove that doing new things that are potentially discriminatory um, are bad before, and rather than burden being on the plaintiffs to choose to say, you know, X state has already done this bad thing. Now court, please step in to stop it. Because as we've seen, um, you know, courts are sort of disjointed in how they respond to things. They could be, uh, you know, it's often both too early and too late to bring any kind of redistricting litigation. Um, and so, you know, the two things that the Voting Rights Act Section 2 the portion of the Voting Rights Act that applies nationwide that's still uh, active today is concerned about is cracking and packing of majority minority uh, communities. So, you know, cracking of community, essentially avoiding drawing a majority minority district where you can, and packing community is, you know, creating a district that is unnecessarily packed. Uh, you know, it could be a, a jurisdiction where minority voters can vote uh, their candidate of choice in with only 55% of the vote, but a state has chosen to create a majority minority district that's 70, 80, 90 um, percent majority minority. And so it's really sort of a, a, a question of degrees. And so what you're seeing in this round of redistricting is, is the both kinds of uh, discrimination with respect to minority voters. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about, you know, a couple of cases that I'm aware of, um, you know, there's litigation in Illinois right now where Democrats have essentially um, hacked and cracked minority voters in a way that uh, rather than drawing uh, majority Latino or majority black districts, particularly in areas around Chicago, they've decided to break those districts up in a way that benefits Democrats, but may mean that a white Democrat gets elected, but not a black or Latino Democrat. Um, and so both, uh, Latino voters and uh, LDF are involved in that litigation and Republicans in that instance are actually on the side of minority voters. They, are, they also are saying that what uh, Illinois did is discriminatory versus in places like um, uh, Alabama, which I won't talk too much about except to say that they're a challenge to uh, Alabama's congressional districts, even though there is one majority black district in Alabama, uh, there's enough population to draw two out of seven. Uh, and so that is sort of the similar situation, except in that instance, 
um, it would potentially benefit Democrats. And the reason why, you know, we, we sort of, I think what gets talked about in terms of, in partisan terms is actually, um, you know, what's happening is, is that majority minority districts get thought of as democratic districts or that there's some benefit to, to being more majority minority districts always for Democrats, but it's not necessarily true. What's, what's actually going on so that folks understand is that this phenomenon called racially polarized voting, which is that uh, black voters by voters of color generally tend to vote for uh, minority candidates and white voters um, tend to vote for white candidates. And that's consistent across parties. You can see in, in primary elections, it's not in every single state in the union, not in every single instance, but in general, what is true is that, you know, Black voters, if they see a Black Democrat riding, running in a primary, are more likely to vote for them than they are a white Democrat, and vice versa. And so because of that, because you kind of know general, and then a, a second layer of racially polarized voting is you generally know, for example, particularly for Black voters, that you know a Black voter is um, much more likely to vote for a Democrat than in some instances even a registered Democrat, depending on which state you're talking about. And so that creates this uh, phenomenon of racially polarized voting creates an incentive for both parties for Democrats to, you know, in some instances, create majority minority districts, which is what you saw in Wisconsin, where uh, the state legislature, excuse me, the governor was trying to put forward a district, uh, a new majority minority district in the state assembly. The Supreme Court essentially uh, blocked that attempt um, and eliminated uh, and then the state Supreme Court ultimately adopted a, a districting scheme that eliminated uh, a majority minority district that the governor had proposed, whereas in Wisconsin, or excuse me, Illinois, as I said, you see Democrats are sort of engaged in a game in which they are breaking up majority minority districts because they know how minority voters vote. And uh, even though a black or Latino Democrat may not get elected, um, they want to make sure that Black voters and Latino voters are spread out in such a way that it benefits their party. Um, and so I, I will stop there because I think um, we don't have a lot of time left, but um, I think it's important to think about these in this issues of redistricting, not just in terms of Democrats and Republicans, but specifically in terms of the impact on redistricting of, uh, of Democrat, or excuse me, of, uh, on Black and other communities of color. Great, thank you very much to the panelists for their remarks. Um, as I mentioned before, if people in the audience have questions, please submit them using the Q&A feature and I'll try to get to as many as I can. Um, let me start with a question for Jason. Um, a few years ago in the, the Ruscio litigation, uh, you and some other lawyers argued that um, partisan gerrymandering claims are inherently non-justiciable. And of course, this was the, the argument the Supreme Court eventually uh, adopted. Um, this year, we've seen Republican plaintiffs, as you mentioned, uh, bringing and winning partisan gerrymandering claims uh, in state court uh, in places like Maryland and New York. Uh, so I'm curious if this means that uh, Republicans now believe uh, that courts are capable of handling partisan gerrymandering claims. So I think there are, you know, at least in Oregon and in New York, there were express prohibitions against partisan considerations in districting, which I think is a little bit different than partisan gerrymandering. I still think assessing these partisan gerrymandering claims either under state law is exceedingly difficult. You know, and I, I know Professor Stephanopoulos, you've written a lot about this, but you know, a lot of these modelings and, and things, one thing we know about voters is there's constant change in how voters vote, right? whether you're using a secretary of state's race from two years ago or a presidential race from 2020 or a presidential race from 16 can have a big impact on how you predict a future election is gonna, is gonna turn out. And I think that uncertainty about how voters vote uh, and trying to predict the future is really challenging. I mean, I'll give you a great example. And this was a, a racial gerrymandering case, but I think the same analysis applies. Um, you know, in the Bethune Hill case, which was you know, on remand from the Supreme Court after they told the Virginia House they didn't have standing to appeal, uh, the trial court looked at it and said, well, and again, this was a racial gerrymandering case, said, look, the political scientists are telling us we can drop the Black voting age population of this district and still, you know, have this district perform for African-American voters, 
And in two seats, they dropped the, the black voting age population, one from 59% to 46%, and another from 56% to 53%. And guess what happened two years later? You know, a white Republican candidate won both of those districts, and those are the two districts by which Demo by which Republicans now control the Virginia House. So I think political scientists trying to predict future behavior of voters is still fraught with peril, despite the fact that state courts are stepping into that, that foray. Great, thanks. Let me turn to Michael. Um, there, there was a major effort at federal statutory redistricting reform this year. Uh, and a, a, a big omnibus election reform bill passed uh, the, the House, but then ultimately didn't have enough support to uh, break a Senate filibuster. Um, could you say a few words about what was in this proposal with respect to redistricting and uh, how it would have changed the, the line drawing process uh, in the country? Um, so yeah, the, the bill, had a number of names. It started off as the For the People Act and then became the Freedom to Vote Act and then ultimately the John R. Lewis Freedom to Vote Act. Um, and the bill itself changed a bit over, over time. Initially, the idea was that all states would be required to use independent commissions. Um, and that was sort of the cornerstone of it. In addition, there were there was a statutory ban on partisan gerrymandering, similar to what you have in the New York Constitution and other Constitution, so it's a little bit broader because it would have penalized both um, partisan effect and intent. Um, and and um, over time, the commission piece got got dropped um, because there were um, of opposition from some senators. Um, and what was left was having uniform national criteria for how you draw maps, which really right now you don't have. Right right now, um, you know there are oftentimes very explicit rules about how you draw legislative districts. There are very few rules on how you draw um, congressional districts in most states. And so, you know, there's, and the rules sometimes are inconsistent with one another to the extent they do exist. And so this would have unified the rules for congressional redistricting for the very first time. Um, and it would have included enhanced protections for communities of color. It would have included a ban on partisan gerrymandering. Um, and it would have required at least consideration of keeping communities together. Because of course that is one of the things that people most complain about when they, they, they talk about maps. Like, oh my God, like how is part of Denton County joined with the Texas Panhandle? Like how is, how is suburban Dallas like in any way similar to the Texas Panhandle, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, and that, um, and you know, I think one of the innovations that came in late in the process, and I'll share my screen in just a second, is that the the bill would have had a rebuttable presumption of partisan gerrymandering, so, so that if a if a map produced high rates of partisan bias, um, using the efficiency gap under two out of the four um, test elections, the last two Senate elections, U.S. Senate elections in the state, and last two presidential elections in the state, then it would be presumed um, to be a partisan gerrymander until the state rebutted. Right, and so and, and the map would be blocked from being used until the state rebutted. You know, the state could prove like, oh well, like there there are neutral reasons, or you couldn't draw a better map, or 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 the like. Um, but the, the burden would be on the state to rebut, and that I think would have been a really powerful tool, um, and it would have like helped speed up litigation in a number of states. And I will just briefly share my screen. Um, And you could see there, uh, the states in yellow, uh, we analyzed, they, they would not <laughs> trigger this rebuttable presumption. The states in the lighter colors um, would have triggered it, but just barely. So they, these, the, the light blue and light pink states would have needed some change, but probably not a whole lot. You could probably tweak it a little bit to, to avoid triggering the presumption. Um, but the states in the dark red and the dark blue, which include like Illinois, New York for Democrats and Georgia and Texas for Republicans um, would have triggered the presumption of, you know, they, they had very significant partisan bias, um, you know, like, uh, and, and they would have been blocked from being used until the state rebutted. And if the state couldn't rebut in time, a court had the power to put a temporary map in place to sort of address the, the violations. And this, um, again, you know, passed the House, um, did not, end up passing the Senate um, because of the filibuster. So uh, it would have been a really powerful tool. Um, it would have caught both Democratic <laughs> and, and Republic maps in some like New Jersey's where, um, you know, where you had a pro-Democratic bias um, because the commission, the, the, the tie-breaking member ended up picking, you know, a, a Democratic map. Um, and so 
um, and and um, would have been a really really powerful tool. It also would have picked up the, the map that Governor DeSantis is currently proposing in Florida, which would create up to uh, you know twenty Republican seats in in Florida out of the the twenty eighth of the state house. So let me stop sharing. And so that's a quick update on that. But um, you know certainly a good framework for the future going forward. Yeah, can I just weigh in on that the partisan gerrymandering for just a second? Sure, kind of in ahead, response to that. Yep. So here's here's kind of my view on on what some of the problems with these various partisan gerrymandering standards are. One, you know, all of these partisan metrics make an assumption that or start with a baseline presumption that your statewide share of votes should equivalent should be equivalent to your statewide share of seats in the legislature. The problem is we don't like they do in the European countries, we don't elect people on a party basis, we elect people on a geographic basis, and the distribution of voters is not uniform throughout any state for any particular party. So what almost none of these partisan bias or partisan fairness measures account for is frankly the extreme concentration of likely democratic voters in some of the larger urban areas. And I think that is kind of my side's big problem with a lot of this partisan gerrymandering um, sort of machinations yeah. that are going on. I mean, my, my side sort of views it as, you know, Democrats, frankly, looking to the courts and to, and to the academy for a solution to their political geography problem. And, and that's why I think you see my side often resisting things like the proposals that were in that federal legislation. Yeah, I mean, I, I will I will say like I, I once participated on a, a FedSoc panel with the Hans of Spakowski, who argued that Pennsylvania's bias, you know, at the time it had a 13-5 uh, pro-Republican map, 13 Republican seats, five Democratic seats in a 50-50 state was totally due to the fact that Democrats were concentrated in Pennsylvania and or in, in Philadelphia and in Pittsburgh, um, to which somebody said like, well, why don't you then have like an independent commission for all the maps if it's all political geography. And he's like, no, 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 we can't do that because obviously it isn't all political geography and having a 13-5 skew in a 50-50 state is, you know, like I, I agree totally with you, Jason, but in some states there is a political geography issue and that's, but not in all states. And this is why um, under the Freedom to Vote Act, like you, there would be a rebuttable presumption the state could come in and say like, oh, well, it's all political geography or something like that. You could prove that, but you know, like coming up with 10-3 in North Carolina, 13-5 um, um, in, in Pennsylvania, or, 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 or frankly, you know, the 22 Democratic seats in New York versus the four, four Republican seats, like, you know, that's not neutral, right? I mean, like, I think we could all say that. And I think, you know, there are lots of ways you can show how that was accomplished through very strategic choices, both by Democrats, like in New York and Illinois, but also by Republicans and other states. So. Then this, this, uh, this raises a, a question from one of the audience members. Let me turn to that. So uh, uh, Jason mentioned proportional representation, which typically is, is a reference to a system that uh, doesn't rely on single member districts uh, that um, have their winner selected by, by plurality uh, of voting. Um, and, and of course, you know, uh, uh, single member districts are not in the US Constitution. Um, state legislatures are free to adopt uh, proportional representation if they wanted to. Uh, Congress could also permit or mandate uh, proportional representation at the federal level. Uh, and so I'm curious what the panelists think about that alternative to the American status quo. Should we, should we be more uh, seriously considering alternatives to uh, the, the single member districts that we've always known here. Well, setting aside- I and, and do, and do, yeah, Joel, why don't you uh, chime in? Yeah, I was going okay, to join by just briefly saying, you know, I, I think with respect to Congress, you know, certainly um, about 20 years ago, Justice O'Connor and Justice uh, Thomas both said that, you know, um, cumulative voting could be one option that could be used for congressional redistricting. What cumulative voting does is essentially a form of proportion representation that allows for if you get X number of votes, then you get X number of seats, depending on, you know, some mathematical variances. But that has been, you know, a way in which minority voters have had representation in uh, it after Voting Rights Act litigation. So, you know, challenges to not to state uh, redistricting, but challenges to local city and county systems of election. Uh, that has essentially worked. You know, it's allowed for opportunities for people to get elected without having to deal with these problems of, you know, how lines are drawn 
uh, is ensuring that there's representation for folks. Um, you know, as you said, Nick, there's not uh, federal law currently requires um, that districts be drawn for congressional elections, but I think that you know some states like Illinois in the past uh, have used uh, proportionate representation, cumulative voting, limited voting for for methods of electing their state legislatures. So it's something that I think um, it would be great to see folks look uh, it to as an option that doesn't involve the sort of um, line drawing and gerrymandering that we have today. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that there's a political will. I mean, maybe you could do it through ballot initiative in some states. I'm not sure like where otherwise that there's sort of the political will in the, the system to change it because there's obviously a lot of vested interest of, of both parties, right? In, in, in the existing status quo and like changing anything is scary to people. Um, I do think that there will be increased um, interest potentially in this, um, you know, particularly on the left, um, you know, as, you know, a remedy for, for partisan gerrymandering, right? You know, like, you know, the, like the, you know, the inability and also likewise to, I think it, it could potentially be a really important tool to, to, to make sure that communities of color are represented. You know, most people of color in the country, in the metro areas of the country now live in the suburbs, not in the cities. And it's hard to draw majority black or majority Latino or majority Asian districts in the suburbs, right? I mean, they're, they're pretty much hodgepodge places like Fort Bend County, Texas, where, you know, the high schools are like 25% white, 25% black, 25% Latino, 25% Asian, right? And, and that's sort of like the makeup of the communities. And so it's it's very hard sometimes to access the, the remedies as they exist under the voting rights act. So I do think like there is increased interest about how do we meet what John Adams said, like, you know, John Adams said, like, legislatures and by extension, Congress should be an exact portrait of miniature of the people as a whole. And how do we ensure that in a world where, you know, maybe single member districts are not the best way to do that, especially when you end up having people draw single member districts that like take parts in suburban Dallas and join them to the Texas panhandle, right? Right. Here's the other you know, question. On the other hand, go ahead. Go ahead, Jason. Go ahead. Let me just add one thing. I mean, look, the fact, the fact that that people of racial minority groups live in neighborhoods next to people of whatever the majority group is in that area is actually a good thing. And it's a great development from where we were in 1965, where there was you know, lawfully racially segregated housing in a lot of parts of the country. So I think we've come a long way. And I think you know, we need to recognize that too, um, as we move forward. It, it, it right. is a great thing, except when you draw lines and you make the cuts, along racial lines as happens in the suburbs and has happens elsewhere. Like, you know, if you actually just drew like nice compact districts in place like Fort Bend County and let the Republicans compete for the votes of Latinos and Asians and, and everything else, that would be great. But in, they didn't, they like take in Fort Bend County, they took some some minority voters stuck them in districts in Houston and then backfilled them with white voters, right? You know, and that's really sort of the problem. I mean, it gets at the racial essentialization that sort of goes there because like Republicans in Texas drew maps as, as though they were assuming that if you're a person of color, you're a Democrat and therefore, you know, like you're you're hostile, right? Like, why not draw the districts and say, like, we, we can compete for our share of Latino voters, we can compete for our share of Asian voters. We don't have to win all of them, but we have to win, you know, our fair share of them. We would be a better country if like we had fair districting and people, both parties just had to compete for the multiracial coalitions of the future. So let me, Michael let me, says let me, that, let me, and let me then, just, you know, the, and then on Friday, the, the uh, let, Democrats- let me, let me, With only five minutes left, let me turn to another question from the audience, if sure. I can. Um, so, uh, and, and this relates to, to one of your earlier uh, uh, remarks, Jason. So th there's an argument that's being advanced right now uh, that state legislatures should have uh, exclusive uh, or plenary authority over congressional redistricting. Uh, and so state courts, uh, maybe governors, maybe other uh, uh, state officials uh, shouldn't have authority over, uh, over congressional uh, redistricting. Um, there's a textual basis for this claim, which is the, the language of uh, the elections clause. It, re it refers to uh, the legislature thereof. Um, but putting aside the constitutional text, is there any normative or policy reason uh, to want state legislatures to be able to have uh, free reign over the shape of congressional maps uh, without constraints from any other actors? Well, I think you have to read that, you have to read that in conjunction with the Supreme Court's decision in the Arizona State Legislature case, where the court said, essentially, we're going to allow, or we're not going to prohibit states from adopting things like commissions by ballot measure um, and, and things like that. In other words, we, we want the states to follow their lawful process. 
I mean, I think if you take the argument to the extreme, it would say governors should play no role in, in congressional districting legislation. But I don't think that's what I don't think that's exactly what North Carolina is arguing. I think what they're arguing is when you take language that's 300 years old that was never conceived of of applying to redistricting in a state that has rejected changes to amend their constitution to specifically address gerrymandering and to suddenly discover that 300 year old language means no partisan gerrymandering is beyond what the is beyond the role of the courts in other words i i think that there are some folks who oppose what north carolina is asking the supreme court to do who are kind of taking the argument to an extreme where i don't think north carolina is necessarily going so i think there are some boundaries i'm not i don't think that at least my version of the argument there isn't that there is no role for state courts or governors but it's got to be part of the state's actual legal process in other words judges making up things like the North Carolina Supreme Court did, um, you know, is different than what, let's say, is happening in New York or Ohio, where there's enacted legislation or constitutional amendments that actually give the courts some guidance to draw from. That's obviously, you know, state courts are the ones who interpret state constitutions. So, you know, I, I guess I am confused by, you know, trying to draw a distinction. It's essentially asking the federal courts to step in and reinterpret a state constitution or say when a, a state court has overstepped its interpretation of a state constitution. And the basics of our federal system is that state courts, state legislatures, state governors, states play a role in sort of governing themselves unless our federal constitution says otherwise. Um, you know, I, I don't have a, a specific dog in this fight except that it, it sort of the hypocrisy of going from, uh, you know, being very concerned about state rights, state's rights and state's ability to do whatever they want, whenever they want, except when a state court steps in or a state governor steps in of a party that you don't like. Um, so, you know, at least from the perspective of black voters, I think looking at what North Carolina did where they specifically said, you have to take in consideration the rights of African-American voters when you're engaged in redistricting as well as the rights of Democrats and Republicans, um, you know, very concerned about a, a doctrine that essentially takes a hands-off approach. Uh, it says, you know, state courts, if you interpret your state constitution in a way that we don't like, we're going to go to the US Supreme Court and have them strike down uh, whatever you do. Great, thank you. I think in the interest of time, we don't have uh, the, the, the time to ask it to, to pose any more questions for our panelists. I think that'll bring us to the end of our uh, hour. Um, so please, Jamie, please join me in thanking our, our terrific panelists for their presentation, uh, which have really illuminated for us the, the complex uh, and important topic of redistricting. Thank you very much to, to all of you.